Luke chapter 1 and verse 26. Call his name Jesus. And we're going to talk about the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 1 and verse 26. Everybody have that? Say praise the Lord. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, sin I know not a man? The angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. Amen. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Mary rose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judea. Amen. Beautiful, isn't it? Let's pray. Father, we just thank you right now for your glorious word. Have your way, Lord. We praise you. We worship you and glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. If you would just keep your Bibles open because I'm going to be making reference to these verses here that we have just read. Look at verse 26 again, please. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Okay, the sixth month would have been the sixth month since the announcement came to Zechariah that his wife was going to carry John the Baptist. So, Elizabeth has been pregnant for six months. So this is the time frame here. The Bible says the angel goes to Galilee, a city uh, in Galilee, Galilee named Nazareth. This is where Mary and Joseph resided in Nazareth. Okay, you with me so far? The scripture tells us the city of Nazareth in Galilee. Very, very unusual that God would come in flesh and be born in this place called Galilee. Because Galilee is basically the sinful area of that part of the world. Galilee would be where you would have a garrison a little bit of ways out from Nazareth. You would have a little garrison, a large garrison, actually, of Roman soldiers. And as you know, uh, military men sometimes, they're pretty wild. They're pretty sinful. So what they would do is these Roman military men, they would go from that garrison close to Nazareth. They would go over there into the city of Nazareth, and there would be all kinds of carousing, all kinds of sin for activity that would take place there by these Roman soldiers. And not only that, but there were the zealots that lived in Galilee. The zealots were the ones, the Jewish men, who were always looking for an opportunity to kill those Roman soldiers. And because of the garrison that was outside of Galilee, or outside of Nazareth, and those soldiers going into Nazareth and partying and all kinds of sinful activities going on there, that was a perfect place for the zealots 
to locate their headquarters. So they located their headquarters right there in Nazareth, and those zealots were the, the dagger carriers. They were experts. They knew exactly how to carry a knife. They could slip a knife out from underneath their coat, and immediately they could kill somebody just like that. They were zealous for Israel, and they hated the Roman soldiers. So you had the headquarters of the zealots, and you had all kinds of sinful activity with the Roman soldiers going on there. It was a, a wild place, to say the least. Are you with me so far? Not only that, but Galilee, because of its location to the Lake of Galilee, you know, Lake of Galilee. You see, Luke had been a few places, so he, he knows it's a lake. It's not a sea. The other writers, when they write, they call it the Sea of Galilee because they hadn't been anywhere before. So for them, any body of water, you know, it looked like a big sea. But anyway, it was it really the Lake of Galilee was located there. And because of that, these people, the Galileans, were the ones who supplied fish for Israel. A large portion of fish would go out from Galilee into Israel, and they received the fish from these, these people in Galilee. And not only that, there was a large uh, harvest that took place in Galilee. So Israel was supplied with fish and with a lot of their grain from this territory called Galilee. So in Galilee, you would have had the rich people. The rich people would have lived there. And not only that, it was a large territory of Gentiles. Gentiles would have been there. Are you with me so far? So in Galilee, the rich people would have been there, but they were like peasants. They were rich because they were farmers. They were rich because they were fishermen. But they were really not educated. So they were rich peasants that lived in this place. And the scribes and the Pharisees would look at this place that the fish came from and the grain came from. And they would see those rich people there in Galilee because they you know, had these uh, provisions there. The scribes and Pharisees would not live in Galilee. They would live in Jerusalem because Jerusalem would be the place of wisdom. If you're going to be wise, go to Jerusalem. If you're going to be wise, live in Jerusalem. If you're going to be rich, they said, live in Galilee. There's nothing wrong with riches, but these people, are you with me so far? This was the kind of culture. They weren't wise, they weren't educated, but they were wealthy. So my point is this, for Jesus to be born in this place, this place is a melting pot for sin. It, you've got murder going on there. The zealots are there, you know. You've got rich peasants everywhere. And you would think that Messiah would be born in Jerusalem among wise people. Not in Galilee area where you got all that sin going on and you got the rich people there, but they're not very smart. You would think Messiah, if Messiah is going to come into the world, that he would come from Jerusalem, not Galilee. But this is where the angel Gabriel appears to a young virgin at. He doesn't appear to a virgin in Jerusalem. He appears to a virgin in Galilee and a little city in Galilee, really just a village in Galilee. And he makes the announcement to Mary that she is going to be the one who gives birth to the Son of God in the most, the highly unlikely place of Galilee, highly unlikely place of Nazareth would be where he would be raised. Now, he would be born in Bethlehem, but he would be raised in Nazareth. Now, you remember... In the Gospel of John, the question was asked, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? You understand? Because in that culture, they understood, Man, there's not much good. You can't find uh, much good in Nazareth. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? But yet Jesus was called Jesus of Nazareth. A village in Galilee. So now you know why that question was asked. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth because of the situation that was there? But that is the very place that God chose to robe himself in flesh in the womb of a virgin and be 
and then raised there, but born in Bethlehem. Y'all with me so far? So the scripture gives us the background here. Now, it tells us in verse 27 to a virgin. Y'all understand that's why he's called Jesus of Nazareth? Okay. To a virgin is spouse to a man whose name was Joseph. Now, she is a virgin. She has never known a man. She's approximately 14 years of age. How do we know that? The Bible doesn't tell us she was 14. It doesn't give us her age. We just know that she's a young maiden. She's a virgin that is a spouse to Joseph. She's betrothed. Well, in this culture, if you were not married by the age of 15 or 16, you were looked at as over the hill. I'm serious. Okay? So she was around 14 years of age. She was a teenager when the angel Gabriel appeared to her and declared to her that she was going to give birth to the Son of God. Can you imagine being 14 years old, 14, 15 years old thereabouts, and an angel appears to you and tells you, you're going to be the one who's going to give birth to the Son of God, the promised Messiah of Israel. Wow. Amazing, isn't it? She was a virgin, but she was a spouse to Joseph. She was betrothed. In that culture, that's equal to marriage. You with me so far? Equal to marriage. What they would do is they would have a civil ceremony. They would come under a canopy. And the man, an older man by the way, would normally marry that young woman. You with me so far? And there's nothing perverted about that. That was that culture. Okay. So that older man, Joseph, would... Have been betrothed, by the way, they arranged the marriage long beforehand. It was arranged by the parents. Okay? You know, sometimes I kind of like that idea. You know, I see one little girl running around here. I think, I think I'll choose her for Jeremiah, you know. And I hadn't found anybody yet good enough for Victoria yet. <laughs> You know how that is, daddy's girl, you know how that is, praise the Lord. <laughs> but, but anyway, in that culture, you know, they chose the, the husband-to-be and the wife. You know, they, they arranged it, the, the parents did. And then at a particular time, they would come under a canopy, and they would enter into a civil marriage. It's called betrothal. It was much more than an engagement. It was an actual civil ceremony of marriage called betrothal approximately a year later thereabouts then they would come back together in a religious ceremony are you with me a, a the for, the completion of the marriage in the religious ceremony and then that's when the husband and the wife would come together in intimacy all right but the fact that she was a spouse to joseph was a legal binding civil marriage she was married to him. Okay? It hasn't been completed yet. Not until about a year later when they get, have the religious ceremony. And then they come together in intimacy. That's when it's, you know, completed. But I need to get this in your mind. It was much more than an engagement. It was a marriage. Say amen. amen. And as we continue the, to read here. The Bible says, again, verse 27, to a virgin is spouse to a man whose name was Joseph. So she's a virgin. She's never known a man before. She's never been intimate with a man before, right? But she is a spouse to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. Now, Joseph was of the line of David. Mary was also of the line of David through another line. But they're both related to King David. You understand? They had different lines. David's line was split. But both of them were related to David. Joseph was and also Mary was. If they did not live under Roman occupation and Roman authority, then Joseph could have been the king of Israel. If they had not lived under Roman occupation, Mary could have been the queen of Israel. They had royal blood in their veins. 
they were of the family of David. Are you with me so far? Okay. The scripture goes on, it tells us, in verse 28, The angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou, thou art highly favored. She is favored. That means she's found grace in the eyes of God. It does not mean that Mary was sinless. She was favored, but not sinless. Look at verse 47. The Bible says, Mary, when she sings her song, And my spirit hath rejoiced in God, my Savior. So Mary also needed a Savior because Mary was born with sin. Do you understand? Mary was not sinless. She needed a Savior just like all of us need a Savior. Are you with me so far? That goes contrary to some teachings by some Maybe one or, I don't know how many religious groups, but one specific religious group says Mary, you know, was without sin. That is not true. She needed a Savior. So the reason why the angel came to Mary was not because she had sinless perfection in her life. She was not sinless. She needed a Savior just like you and I do. Okay? She found favor in the eyes of God. That means grace. She had to have grace. God, by the grace of God, she was going to carry Jesus Christ. Not because she earned it, not because she was worthy of it, but because of the favor or the grace of God, she was chosen from among women, which means that God had choices. Mary did not have to be the mother of Jesus. God had choices. But in His sovereignty... He chose Mary among women. Say among women. Amen. Mary wasn't the only virgin there. I doubt it. You, are you with me so far? Amen. Mary's not the only devout young woman in Nazareth there. God could have chose somebody else. But he sovereignly chose this young woman named Mary. And it was not because she deserved it. It's because grace of God was operating or the favor of God was there. And Mary needed a Savior just like us. Amen? Amen? Okay. I'm just going to teach you this morning. So notice it says, the angel says, Hail thou, thou art highly favored of the Lord. Uh, thou art highly favored the Lord is with thee. Well, sure, that's right. You, you definitely got the favor of God upon you. If you've been chosen to carry the promised Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, you definitely have favor from God. No doubt about that. Now the scripture continues. He says, The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Yeah, she's blessed. Why is she blessed among women? She's going to give birth to the Son of God. Now, she's not going to give birth to God. She is not the mother of God. So we're taking care of two false teachings. One is that she was sinless. And the other one is that some religious institutions say that she was the mother of God. Mary is never called the mother of God. God is without beginning and ending of days. She didn't give birth. Uh, to God she's not the mother of God but the one that she would give birth to is God you understand that she's not the mother of God but the one that she's going to give birth to is God so don't ever call Mary the mother of God she was the mother of the son of God she was the mother of Jesus Christ who is God but she didn't give birth to God. Hallelujah. Amen. Now let me, let me deal with another issue here. She was a virgin when the angel appeared to her. She was a virgin when she gave birth to Jesus Christ. But she didn't stay a virgin after that. The scripture tells us that Jesus had, you know, some brothers, some family members. Mary gave birth to some children. After she gave birth to Jesus. She was a virgin before his birth. She was a virgin after his birth. But after he, he was born, 
Joseph and Mary came together and she had children just like any woman who has children today she had children the question is asked did she have pain when she gave birth to Jesus how many of y'all know the answer to that question did Mary have pain when she gave birth to the Son of God well, we know she had pain thereafter when she gave birth to other children. But did she have pain when she gave birth to Jesus? Yes, she did. She's a natural mother in a fallen world. She had pain when she gave birth to Jesus. Even though, you with me so far, she was a virgin before his birth, during his birth, but then afterward, she gave birth to some more children. Amen? I was listening to the radio the other day, and there was a Catholic priest on the radio, and this Catholic priest was talking about you know, Jesus, you know, his birth, and Mary the Virgin, the, the mother of Jesus. He said that it's a perpetual virginity. That's what he said. I heard it on the radio. Okay? He said that the Virgin Mary was a perpetual virgin, that she was a virgin before she gave birth to Jesus. She was a virgin during the time that she gave birth to Jesus, and she stayed a virgin after she gave birth to Jesus. She was a perpetual virgin. That's what a Roman, this, and I'm talking about not just a Roman priest, but I'm talking about a man who's high up in that uh, arrangement. And this is what he said. He said, for you to say otherwise is a horrible sin. And that when you stand before God on judgment day, if you have stated otherwise that, Jesus, that Mary wasn't a perpetual virgin, that God's going to look at you and say, what have you said about my mother? That's what he said on the radio. What have, that God is going to look at people who did not believe in the perpetual virginity of, of Mary, that God is going to look at them and say, what did you say about my mother? You've sinned horribly if you don't believe in the perpetual virginity of Mary. That's totally unbiblical. Well, you know, they also, he also made a statement there. On the radio, he said, if you're not a part of Roman Catholicism, you cannot be saved. Strike two. <laughs> well, watch this. And then he made another statement. He said, if you're not walking in the graces or the teachings of Roman Catholicism, even though you are a Roman Catholic by profession... If you're not walking in it, you cannot be saved. Wow. Well, see, there's some Pentecostals don't think you've got to live for God, think you're going to make it to heaven anyway. So, you know, he, he missed the fact that you had to be a Catholic, obeying the Catholic teachings to be saved. But I do agree one thing, you're going to have to walk with God and live for God if you're a, I expect to be saved in the end times. Or ever saved. Okay. So she was a virgin. She was a virgin before. She was a virgin at the time of his birth. But after he was born, she gave birth to other children. Okay. Praise the Lord. So I, I'm going to stick with the Bible. I'm not too worried about when I stand before God on Judgment Day that God's going to ask me, what did you say about my mother? That the Virgin Mary wasn't a perpetual virgin. Horrible sin. You know. Are y'all awake? I heard that with my own ears. And I wrote it down. Okay. But anyway, praise God for the virgin birth. I believe in the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. The virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ is critical. If you don't believe in the virgin birth, you cannot be saved. He is the seed of the woman. He is, was the virgin-born son of God, which means that Joseph was not his natural father. God didn't use a man 
He, he didn't have man as an aid in the process of this birth. So Jesus did not inherit the sin nature that comes from man. He's the son of God. She's a virgin. He is the seed of the woman, which means he has, he gets his human nature from his mother's side. He gets his deity nature from his daddy, or he is the father. You with me so far? So he did not have a sin nature. If he was not virgin born, he cannot be your savior or my savior because that means he's got a sin nature just like you and me and he's no different from any other man. If you don't believe that he's virgin born, you cannot be saved. The blood of Jesus does nothing for you. I'm telling you, the virgin birth is fundamental to salvation. Because his virgin birth anticipates the finished work of his death, burial, and resurrection. If he's not virgin born, he's not your savior. If he's not virgin born, you cannot be saved. And everybody in here is going to hell, including me. He has to be virgin born. He cannot have that sin nature of Adam in his blood. You with me? That's critical. So the scripture continues. Let's look at it again in verse... 29, and when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. The angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Now I can imagine if an angel appeared to me like that, I would be full of fear too. I mean, this is a frightful visitation. This is a frightful situ situation. Gabriel appearing to her and making that announcement, that is powerful. You understand? Okay, now watch. The Bible says, verse 31, Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, thou shalt call his name Jesus. When God first created the first man, the first Adam, he used neither man nor woman. He made man out of the dust of the ground. He breathed in his nostrils the breath of life. Adam became a living soul without the aid of man or woman. Watch this. Are you with me? Two elements. God uses two elements when he created the first man. He used clay and his breath. With me so far? Whenever, watch this, whenever Jesus is the last Adam is going to be created or born, he is going to be created from two elements. The womb of Mary... And the Spirit of God, who is the last Adam. Are you with me so far? Yeah. So Adam, God created him without the aid of man or woman. He made, he came in the flesh, in the virgin womb of Mary, without the aid of a man, but with the aid of a woman. So that through woman, God is going to bring salvation Amen. for mankind. Are you with me so far? Give God a hand clap of praise. So it tells us, the Bible says in verse 30, The angel said, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Powerful. Jesus. He's going to be God in flesh at conception. Not at birth, at conception. What I'm saying is this. He doesn't begin to be God come in flesh at birth. He begins to be God in flesh at conception. Now, why do I remember that? Because I missed that on one of my, you know, I took a Christology course in college. Uh, and I missed that question, you know. If I'd have just thought about it, I, you know, I wouldn't have missed it. But somehow I feel like I got misinformed by something I read. No. <laughs> but I made a 96 on that test and I should have made a 100. But I missed that question right there. When did Jesus become the Son of God? At conception or birth? I put birth. Hallelujah. <laughs> little trick question, you know. Yeah, I got to make excuses. <laughs> but, but really... He was the Son of God at conception. The Spirit of God overshadowed Mary. 
The glory of God, the Shekinah glory, the radiating presence of God, God in activity, overshadowed Mary, the womb of Mary, and put his word in her womb. The word was God, and that word was God come in flesh. You understand? It was a supernatural miracle. God, watch this, Elizabeth was going to give birth to a miracle baby called John. John is a guarantee of a miracle baby named Jesus. Both of them are going to give birth to their children by supernatural, miraculous workings of God. Elizabeth was barren and old. She's going to have a miracle baby. Mary's a virgin, never known a man, but the Spirit of God is going to move over her. A supernatural birth is going to take place. Now, watch this. Does that mean she's got two daddies? Or Jesus have two fathers? I thought God was the father of Jesus. How many of y'all would lift your hand and say, yes, God is the father of Jesus? Right? God is the father of Jesus, absolutely. But the Bible tells us that the Holy Ghost is going to overshadow Mary. If you believe in three separate persons, then you've got two fathers. You've got God, and you've got the Holy Ghost, both of them. He didn't have two fathers. He only had one father. There's no such thing as three separate persons. The Holy Ghost is the Spirit of God in activity or action. Okay? Y'all with me so far? So the Holy Ghost is going to overshadow her. Now, we have the explanation from the... from uh, from. The word of God here, verse 31. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, shalt call his name Jesus. The gospel of Luke is the most beautiful gospel because it talks more about the virgin birth of Jesus Christ than any other writing in all of the Bible. You with me? It's more beautiful in its announcement of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ than any of the gospels. Mark has more information about Jesus, but Luke has more information about his virgin birth. Are you with me so far? So the scripture tells us, Thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. So this one that's going to be born is going to be a real person. A real man with a physical body. Not a ghost, but a real man with a physical body. You understand that? Praise God. Bible says you're going to bring forth a son Thou shalt call his name Jesus. Now, why is it important for God to come in the form of a man called Jesus? Well, let's talk about his name, Jesus, or the Hebrew, transliterated Hebrew, Yeshua. Why, Mary, do you have to call him Yeshua or Jesus? Because Yeshua means Yahweh, yod heh vav heh is become my salvation. So the God of the Old Testament, Yahweh, is going to robe himself in flesh and he's going to be God my Savior. Mary calls him Jesus. He's going to call his name Jesus. But she says in verse, what is it, 47? My spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. So she's got a revelation now. Are you here? You're going to call him Yeshua or Yahweh is salvation. Isaiah 7, 14, the prophecy. You're going to call his name Emmanuel, which means with us God. So she's going to give birth to the Son of God who Isaiah called Emmanuel. And then Mary says he's God my Savior. His name means Yod hey vav hey or Yahweh is become my salvation. So he's not just a man, he's God in flesh. He's the manifestation of God on this earth in a literal physical body. He's Son of Man, Jesus, Son of Man in his humanity. Son of God in his deity. He is God my Savior. He is Yahweh salvation. 
God's going to come in the form of a man, and you're going to call his name Jesus. When he comes, the name of Jesus speaks of God coming in humiliation. God is going to come in humiliation. The eternal spirit of God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, is going to come in the form of a man. He's going to come in his humiliation. In these gospels, when you call Jesus, Jesus, you're talking about God in humiliation. When he rises from the dead, he will receive a more excellent name. You're going to call him Lord Jesus Christ. But in the gospels, you're, just, you're going to call him, you in the Jesus Christ or Jesus Christ. The Christ. So Jesus is the name of God when God comes in humiliation. It's when, now you get to understand what I'm saying here. It's when God comes and puts blue jeans on. It's when God comes in a way, in a, now that's not, that's real. I, I know he didn't wear blue jeans in that culture, but you, I'm in America today. So you'll understand God coming to this level. God coming down and becoming what you are. Come on. God coming down here and becoming what you are so that you could go where God is. And for God to come down, to condescend to that level, to come in the form of a man like that is beyond comprehension. Now, there are some a analogies that are used. It would be like you or I going down and getting inside of a roach. With all of your intellect, with all of your understanding, with your feelings and your emotions. You are, in case you don't know it, you and I are much higher than a roach. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, if you decided to, you know, to save the ro roach culture... And you decided, you know what, I'm going to do. Somehow I'm going to squeeze my everything that I am into the inside of a roach so I can save those filthy bugs. That's a great gap between man and roach. There's a huge gap there. You understand that? And for God to come down and enrobe himself in flesh is a, con, is a coming down or a, a, it is beyond your comprehension to understand how far God stooped when he was willing to come down and place himself inside of a human being. How far is the gap between deity and dust? But yet because he loved you that much, the eternal, omnipresent, everywhere, omniscient, all-knowing, omnipotent, all-powerful God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. Because he loved you that much, condescended to your level. And robed himself in flesh, and they called him Jesus. Yod Hey Vav Hey has become my salvation. The Creator, the Omnipotent, the Omnipresent, the Omniscient God has come down and condescended to a level that you have no idea. I have no idea. It is a great mystery, the mystery of godliness. But that's how much he loved you. Come on, he didn't take the form of an angel. Hebrews said he didn't take, Hebrews said he didn't take the form of an angel, but he was made like unto his brethren. He was made just like you and me. He came out of a womb just like you and me. He was a baby just like you and I were. He grew, he grew up just like we grew up. But yet he was God. God, when you call him here Jesus, you're talking about God in humiliation. 
God coming down to the level of a man. Come on, somebody. You need to understand that Jesus was not just a man. Jesus was the Son of God. He was and is Emmanuel, which means he was God with us or with us God. Give God a hand clap of praise. <coughs>
But the limitless God, I know that probably went over. <laughs> but the limitless God became limited and was inside of that little baby. And Mary had to take care of that little baby just like your mama had to take care of you, feed you, change your diapers, wipe you, you know, all that good stuff, burp you. But that was God inside of that little baby. The unlimited God, the limitless God became limited in a child so that he could grow up just like you grew up. Now why? Why is that so important? Because, you know, he didn't come as a, in, a, in the form of an angel. He was God come in the form of you and I. God added to himself another nature called humanity. You understand? Why is that so important? Because if he's going to redeem us, he's got to be born here. Adam fell in the Garden of Eden. Adam was born here. God gave Adam the authority and dominion over the whole earth. And when Adam sinned, he turned it all over to Satan. When he rebelled against God. Adam, a man that was born here, God gave him authority in this realm, this earth realm. Why? Because Adam was born in this realm called earth. Do you understand? So Adam, the one who had authority in the earth realm, being born on this earth, then he turned over the ownership, if you, in, a, in a sense, in a spiritual sense. He turned it all over to Satan. Now for God to redeem the earth back and for God to redeem man that is in that earth, God has to come in the form of a man and he's got to be born in this realm to have authority in this realm. If he's not born here, he has no right to act here. So God can just come in the form of an angel. He's got to come in the form of a man. He's got to be born here so he'll have authority, not just in the heavens, but he'll have authority in the earth realm. He being God gives him authority in the heavenly realm. He being man gives him authority in the earth realm. So now he can redeem us. Are you with me? And because he's the last Adam, he is the representative of everybody who gets in him. You're not hearing me, are you? He, just, he couldn't just show up as an angel. No, no, no. He's got to take on the form of a man, somebody that's born here, that has jurisdiction, that can operate here. God come in flesh. Power over heaven and earth. Last Adam. Give God some praise. So, you're going to call his name Jesus or Yeshua, which means Yahweh has become my salvation. He's a real man, a real human being with a real human spirit, with a real human soul. But inside of that man, there is the Spirit of God. He don't just have the Spirit of God. He is God. He is God. Jesus. In those days, to call your son Jesus was not really a big deal. It really wasn't. To call him Yeshua wasn't a big deal. You look at Psalm 118, you'll see... At the end of that psalm, people praying for salvation. That God would save them. And so in anticipation to God's salvation, little boy babies that would be born in that time, many people called their sons Jesus. And still today, many people call their sons Jesus or Jesus. Oh. And in anticipation of the Savior of the world, they would call Him Yeshua, that baby. But you know what that was? Psalm 118. Lord, be my salvation. It was their expression of prayer. God, be my Savior. Be my Yeshua. 
When you go through the, Old, through the Old Testament, you see the word salvation. Every time you see the word salvation, put Yeshua right there. God be my Yeshua. God be my salvation. And now we have the answer to the prayer. God is become Yeshua. God the Lord has become Yeshua. Call his name Yeshua. Call his name Jesus because he's the answer. To the prayer that says, God, be my Yeshua. It's God in his humiliation. But when Jesus is raised from the dead, he's called Lord Jesus Christ. You see what he did for you. How much he loves you. And I, I say you, I know where I am. But what he did for you. The um, unimaginable. Unlimited God becoming limited. God in all of His glory becoming a man coming in humiliation. Stooping that low. In a little baby that's born then grow up and have to deal with all, all the stuff that humanity deals with. And then from there go to a cross. Even go lower than, than what He did. Suffer from the hands of His own creation. Crucified by the hands of his own creation, the creator. You understand? Jesus crucified, God come in flesh, the creator come in flesh. Call his name Yeshua. But see, he's not a prayer that is prayed. He's not like the rest of the little boys running around Galilee there named Jesus. That anticipated him. He's not like the rest of the little boys running around Jerusalem or, or Galilee named Jesus. That was a prayer for God to become that. He is the answer to the prayer of those who said, God, be my Yeshua. He's not the prayer. He's the answer to the prayer. What a great God we serve. You need to not just understand his death, burial, and resurrection. You need to understand his virgin birth. He's the virgin born son of God. Son of man, son of God, son of David, son of Abraham. God enrobed and fleshed, coming down here to become God my salvation. Yeshua my Savior. Isn't that awesome that he would do that, that he would love us that much. Call his name Jesus. Verse 32. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest in his humanity. You see, come on. This is the beginning of the humanity or the sonship of God. It was an eternal forever and ever, only in the mind of God. But in reality and actuality, now at this time when he's going to be conceived, he's going to be God come in flesh. You with me so far? Sonship has a beginning. The Bible says, He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Wow. Angels making that announcement to Mary. He's going to receive the throne of his father David. Oh, powerful. Yeshua, God my Savior. Now he's going to receive the throne of his father David. What does that mean? I told you already, Joseph was a descendant of David. And uh, Mary was a descendant of David through another line. They could have been, he, Joseph could have been a king and Mary could have been a queen. Even though he did not have a natural father, whenever Joseph adopted him, by adoption, he had legal right to the throne of David. Come on. Not just the, he's not just going to sit on the throne of the father. He's going to sit on the throne of David because he's going to come in David's lineage. He's got David's genealogical record, family name. He's going to sit on an earthly throne. The throne of David. Not just the throne of the Father, but the throne of David. Now what is this? What is this? The throne of David. Well, David, come on somebody. David, whew, praise God. 
David had an understanding about the throne. See, we talk about the throne of the throne, you know, and we get in our mind a physical chair. That God's going to give Jesus the throne of his father David, that he's going to give him some kind of physical thing to sit in. But that's not what it's talking about here. When you talk about thrones, you talk about the throne of God, the throne of David. You're talking about a realm of sovereignty. You're talking about authority. You're talking about a kingdom. He's going to be in that. He is a king. He's a king. But let me show you what I'm talking about. When you talk about sovereignty and we're talking about authority and you're talking about rulership, that's what the throne is a symbol of. Because he's going to receive, God's going to give him the throne of his father, David. Power fulfillment to Old Testament prophecy. Are you with me right now? David unlike most people in his days, had a revelation about what that throne meant. David understood that the throne that he sat upon, come on, he understood that God was and is the true king. When you talk about the throne of his father David, you're talking about a man called David who understood that he's not really the true king, that God is the true king. So this throne of David is going to be the throne of God Almighty himself. God has come in flesh. David was on a picture and only a type. He understood he wasn't the true king, but God was the true king, and he was setting his king underneath that king of kings. But now here comes Jesus. He's going to sit on the, the throne of his father, David. God's going to give him that throne. He's, he is God. That is the throne of God. True king is here. The true king of kings is here, and he is God. He's got all authority, all power. He is the sovereign In America, we don't understand these kinds of things. We, we know we got president, we got Democratic Party, we got Republican Party. We, got, oh. we don't understand royalty. We don't understand authority. You, if you understood authority, just say like the English monarchy. They can go to different parts of the world. There's not a physical throne there, but they can say there's where the, the throne of whoever the monarch is. Because they, rep, they understood that this land was under the authority of that queen or that king that's over there in Europe. Do you understand? See? Oh. See, we don't understand that we're a part of a kingdom and that Jesus is the true king because he is God come in the flesh, in the flesh. And he rules and reigns in the spiritual realm right now. We don't understand the kind of authority and the kind of power that we as the people of God operate in the kingdom of Jesus. The son of David, son of God. You with me so far? I think this is a beautiful example. It would be like from a little, little bitty cub you raised a tiger. And you picked that little cub up and you threw it around. And, and it got bigger and bigger and you still picked it up and threw it around. And, Pretty soon it got full grown and you go over there and you just you throw the throw the tiger over in a corner somewhere. It stands up as Paul is taller than you and you just go, whew, just throw it on the ground. Watch. And just one, just one little instant, that tiger could attack you and you'd be dead just like that. But you see that tiger because it was raised being thrown around. It was raised by a man. It wasn't raised by a mother that, that would teach it. You know what? You can kill a man in an instant. So now the tiger doesn't know its power. It doesn't know its authority. It doesn't know that it can kill a man in an instant. And so a man's throwing that tiger around. And in just an instant, if it chose to, it could kill a man. And I'm telling you, that's the way we are. We're like a cub. We've been thrown around. We're thrown around by the enemy. We're thrown around by the world. We don't understand the authority or the power if we just understood that. We wouldn't let the enemy throw us around anymore. We would take authority and dominion over him. 
So God's going to come into the realm of mankind. He's going to come into the realm of darkness and demonic powers. And he's going to operate in authority and power over all of that. If you understood the kingdom that you're a part of, you ought to go forth and operate in that kingdom. And you've got authority because you're baptized in the name of Jesus and you've got power because you've got his spirit inside of you. You shouldn't be letting the devil throw you around. You shouldn't be letting life destroy you. You should take dominion and authority and power over that. You should operate in the realm of the kingdom of God. So when those kings went to battle like David, when he went to battle, he said, I'm not coming in my own name. I'm coming in the name of God. Goliath, you represent all the Philistines. David represents all of Israel. They stand and fall in David. They stand and fall in Goliath. And when Goliath went down, all of the Philistines went down. And when David won, everybody that was in Israel was in David. And when David won, that means all of Israel won. So because you are in the king, Jesus Christ, his victory guarantees your victory. See, we don't understand who we are. So we walk around there. I do, I know, I know. Whenever I start battling with discouragement or whatever, I've forgotten the fact that I'm in a kingdom. I'm operating in a realm. I've got authority. I've got power. Why? Because my representative, my Jesus, my King Jesus, has all authority and all power in heaven and earth. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? So next time that roaring lion comes around you, you just take him in the name of Jesus. Supernatural strength, supernatural power is inside of you. But really what it is, is because of who you are inside of. See, if I come up there in my own strength, enemy will laugh at me. But if he sees me in Jesus... He don't stand a chance. So God's going to give unto him the throne of his father David. He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. Woo! Now he's going to reign over the house of Jacob. You remember old Jacob, right? Old Jacob. A liar, a cheater, conniver in the Old Testament, you know. Come on, when you talk, when you want to talk about the fallen side. Of Jacob, you call him Jacob. When you talk about his spiritual side, God called Israel Israel. You're going to see the prophets when they're preaching. Sometimes they'll call him call Israel Jacob. Sometimes they call him Israel. You know why? Because it just depends on how they're acting. Sometimes they're acting like Jacob, all fleshly, all carnal. Sometimes they're acting like Israel, a man conquered by God. So it just depends on how you act. But here's my point. He's going to be, watch this, say the house of Jacob. Get the wording right. He shall reign over the house of Jacob. Beautiful. Why didn't it say the house of Israel? It says the house of Jacob. Because he wants you to know, my friend, (laughs) that he can take a bunch of Jacobs like you and me, a bunch of cannabis, a bunch of fleshly, weak people. He can take you and then bring you into his kingdom and reign over you and conquer you and make you a part of his kingdom. He'll take Jacob's just like you and turn us into Israel's. And I'm talking spiritually, of course. Bunch of weak, fleshly Jacob's. Not worth a flip. He said, I'll save you, bring you into my kingdom, and I'm going to call you Israel. Give God some praise. That's why he didn't say, you're going to reign over the house of Israel. You're going to reign over the house of Jacob. That gives me hope. That gives me a lot of hope. I don't know about you. You remember what happened to old Jacob, you know, dying, cheating, you know. 
And all of a sudden, an angel of God begins to wrestle with him, you know. And Jacob said, I'm not going to let you go till you bless me. God said, I can't bless you because you got too much of you in you. So I got to get rid of the you in you. Hallelujah. I got to get rid of you, Jacob. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to touch the hollow of your thigh so that from that day forward, you're going to walk with a limp. See, nobody can have an encounter with God and not be changed. When you really come in contact with God, you're going to walk with a limp. You're going to find out real quick that you can't lie, cheat yourself through life. You're going to have to depend on God. So now you're going to walk with a limp. It's going to be a sign forevermore that you're dependent on God. You got to lean on God. You can't do it. You can't walk on your own anymore. You got too much of you inside of you. So I got to get you to understand how much you need God. So he's going to rule over the house of Jacob. He's going to rule over a bunch of people that understand how much they need God. Leaning on the everlasting arms of Jesus. In fact, the Hebrew word in the Old Testament, we get the English word from trust. Literally means to fall on your face. It's not just leaning on him you need. You have fallen flat on your face. You understand if he's not there, you're going to fall flat on your face. But because you know that God is here, now he's the one that's going to hold you up and give you power to live for him. But you got to fall. You and I have to fall flat on our face. Before we'll ever start trusting him. Because until we trust him, fall flat on our face and understand he's got to pick us up and he's got to hold us up. Until we get to that place, we're going to keep trusting in our own ability. We're going to be too full of self. At some point, every one of us in this place, we, become, we go from Jacob to Israel. We become people who have been conquered by God. And now, can you see, I'm walking with a limb. And I got a staff in my hand. And you'll see me in the book of Hebrews. I still got my staff in my hand. I'm pulling my old sick body that's fixing to die up by that staff in my hand. The symbol of my limping throughout life. A symbol that lets everybody know that I trust in God Almighty. And I've fallen flat on my face. I'm totally dependent on God. If you see me weak, that's good. If you see me weak, that's good. Because it is a sign that I stop trying to do it on my own. Woo, glory to the Lamb. <clears throat> so when you're old, when my old Jacob nature starts trying to come out in me, your old Jacob nature starts trying to rise up in you, remember, you got to fall fl- fat, fl- face flat. You got to trust in God. You got to depend on God. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. Remember this hope, this promise that God, God saved Jacob, he can save me. Hallelujah. God can save Jacob, he can save Jerry Carter. God can save Jacob, he might be able to save Daniel. We're still praying about that. But you see, let me help you understand something. When you're weak in your own eyes, then are you strong? And you might feel like a Jacob today, defeated and limping. But I'm telling you, when God comes on you, He will fill you with His power. He will conquer you. And He'll say, come into my kingdom. When you feel weak, that's a good place. When I first got up here, I felt so weak. Hallelujah. But you know what? I'm not depending on my own ability. I'm just somehow trusting at some point God's going to come and He's going to anoint and God's going to empower. He goes, I can take you, Jerry Carter, and I can use you for my glory. You're a nobody in yourself, but I can use you for my glory. You're nothing but a, a, a stumbler. You're nothing but, come on, somebody. You're nothing but a stumbler. You're nothing but a stammer. Stammerer. You're not, nothing without me. That's what I know about my God. He took me like he took Jacob. And he put a, put, he touched the hollow of my thigh. Now I'm walking. I ever, where I go, I say, God, I just got to say, God, I got to trust in you. Because I'm not much. But you are. 
And the fact that Jesus, Yeshua, Hamashiach, Jesus, the Messiah, would come, God, come in flesh, would come that far and be born in this realm and have, come on somebody, be given from God the, the throne of his father David. And then rule over the house of a bunch of Jacobs is a mind-blowing thing. It gives me hope today. That he would show favor to a little 14-year-old maiden. Come on, somebody. That wasn't perfect and didn't deserve anything. And since Mary was Jacob, Mary was in the house of Jacob. But God said, I can use a little 14-year-old girl. To give birth to the man with a name that will change history forever. If you'll believe what I'm preaching. It doesn't matter who you are, where you are, what your roots are. All that doesn't really matter. If you'll believe what I'm preaching and you'll become dependent on God. He can rule over you. Hallelujah. House of Jacob. Give God some praise. See, it's good for us to wrestle with deity every once in a while. But really, deity wrestle with us. Oh, you think you're something, huh? You need to have a fresh encounter with God at Peniel. You need to go, come on, you need to cross the river Jabbok. And you need to have a fresh encounter with God Almighty. Getting a little cocky, huh, son? Get a little arrogant, huh, son? I'll leave you standing there by yourself. That's right. And you will fall flat on your face. Amen. And then when you're laying down there repenting, oh, God, forgive me. Have mercy upon me. I'm a Jacob. I thought I was Israel, but I'm a Jacob right now. He'll say, okay. And he'll give you authority and give you power to rule in his realm, his kingdom operation. Say Amen. Yeah, I love this. Beautiful, isn't it? He's going to reign over the house of Jacob. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. His kingdom. You're a part, if you're born again, baptized in Jesus' name, you're part of the kingdom of God. And I understand progressive, you're moving from, you know, by spirit into that kind of authority and that kind of reign. But I want you to understand something. When you're a part of the kingdom of God, you're talking about God in activity. You're talking about God in action. That's why the Bible says when demons are cast out, tell them the kingdom of God has come upon you. When that devil's cast out, you've just witnessed God in activity. When somebody gets healed, you just experience the kingdom of God because you've experienced God in manifestation. Not just God in spirit form, but God in manifest power. God in manifest power, testing out demons. God in manifest power, healing the sick. That's the kingdom of God. That's the difference between spirit and kingdom is manifestation. Spirit in manifestation. Oh God, thank you Jesus. You write that one down, don't forget that one. That's a revelation that shows you the difference between just being filled with the Spirit and the kingdom of God. You can have the Spirit of God, but it doesn't mean you're operating in the kingdom. But the kingdom of God is Spirit in manifestation. Devils cast out, sick healed. Give God praise. I don't want to just be filled with the Holy Ghost. I want to move in the kingdom. I want God's activity to be seen. I want the blind eyes to open, the deaf ears to open, demon powers to be driven out. That's why he said, when demons are cast out, the kingdom of God has come upon you. You understand? Because God's spirit is everywhere. But when his spirit starts acting, his spirit starts moving, and it starts manifesting, then you move from spirit to kingdom. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink. But righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. God bringing peace to me. God bringing joy to me. God bringing righteousness to me. That is God in action. God, thank God for the revelation. You, oh, listen. You know, I've been preaching kingdom for a long time. And I think this morning, the first time I really understood what I've been preaching.
I understand that realm of authority. But you know what? Now I got a hold of it. I got a handle of it. Because now God give me understanding. It's when God is in action. It's when God is manifest. That's kingdom. So I can tell you right now while I'm preaching, the kingdom of God is upon you because God is in action right now. He is anointing. There is a manifestation of God's presence in this house. When peace comes to you, true peace, that's kingdom. Come on, you, you, can, you, you can try. You can try all day, all night, trying to manufacture peace. Trying to find joy. Trying to find satisfaction somewhere, somehow. Where's my peace? Where's my joy? Come on. You ain't going to have it if you don't have righteousness. So God comes in action. The kingdom of God is not being dreamed of righteous peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Ghost, I told you the Holy Ghost is God in action. Now we've got the kingdom of God manifest in us. Now he brings peace where I didn't have peace. He brings joy where I didn't have joy. He brings righteousness where all I could see was my field. All I could see was my shortcoming. All I could see was my sin. But God comes in activity and he brings me rightness. He puts me in proper alignment with God. And fills me with joy and peace. That is a manifestation of God. The enemy always wants you to pull downward. Hell is downward. The enemy wants to pull you down. He wants to pull your dreams down. He wants to pull your hopes down. He wants to pull you down. But God is heavenward. He wants to lift your hopes. He wants to lift your dreams. He wants to give you joy. He wants to lift your joy. Come on. Hallelujah. And it's so sad that people... You know, sometimes the enemy will come to me and he'll come to you and he'll still tempt you and he'll say, you know what? If you get that, you'll have joy. If you get this, you'll have peace. You know, come on, somebody. If you can just get that person or whatever. You, no, you won't. You're not going to find peace. You're not going to find joy. You can't drug it up enough. Drugs won't give you peace. Liquor won't give you peace. Sex won't give you peace. Nothing will satisfy you but the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only one to give you peace and joy. And that comes by way of righteousness. So it says the kingdom of... Oh, it's beautiful, isn't it? And of his kingdom there shall be no end. I was, I was on my way up here to church. I said, well, I'll probably preach about a, probably an hour today. I don't have much to say. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's me, Jacob. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Oh, thank God. But when God begins to move... Oh, praise God. He take a bunch of Jacobs just like me. I know some of you think you're something. Uh, that's why you're not dependent. That's why you're not moving in the spirit. That's why you sit there dead. But when you understand your need, you understand your vileness, you understand your weakness, you fall on your face and you trust him. Say, God, I got to have a, I know I'm filled with your spirit, God. I know you haven't left me, but I need kingdom right now. I need a manifestation of that spirit. I need you to manifest in peace. I need you to manifest in joy and righteousness right now. I feel like a dog. I feel like a sinner. I feel no good. I don't feel worthy of anything. God, bring righteousness to me. I repent. There shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Jacob, I mean, uh, Zachariah asked the question, but he didn't believe what God said he was going to do. The question that Zachariah asked caused him his mouth to be closed and his ears to be deafened. So he could not hear and he could not speak because when the angel told Zachariah what was going to happen, Zachariah did not believe that it could be done. So God judges unbelief. But Mary asks. She simply wants understanding. She's wanting understanding. She's not saying, I don't believe it can happen. She's saying, I just don't understand how it's going to happen because I've never known a man. I'm a virgin. And normally it takes a man and a woman. God uses the aid of both to conceive a child. But I've never even known a man. And you're telling me that I'm going to have a child. Son of God, I'm a virgin. How can this 
fé. You remember Sarah? She laughed. It's a, it's a, it's a. She laughed. Elizabeth, you're going to have a son. Elizabeth laughed. Poor Sarah. Poor Elizabeth. But Mary, you're going to have a son. And you're going to, it's a, it's a, it's a. You're going to laugh. But your laugh, Mary, is not poor. It's a laughter of belief. How can this be? It's hard. It's hard. It's hard. I know the Bible doesn't say that she laughed. But I know. Because we'll go back to Sarah, who's a type of Elizabeth and a type of Mary. They all laughed. Elizabeth sang the, sang the swan song of the Old Testament. Mary is going to sing the song of the New Testament. And I'm not going to get into that right now. But anyway, hallelujah. They're going, she's going to be full of joy. She's going to have a song of laughter. Her song is going to be a song of laughter. I know not a man. The angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. Holy Ghost is the Spirit of God in action. Not the second person or the third person. But God in action. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. I'm telling you, He's coming upon me right now. The Holy Ghost coming upon, not just upon us, but in us. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. So, you know, if you had three separate persons, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, then if you, you got Father and you got Holy Ghost, then that means that the Son has two fathers. No. <laughs> no, 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 God. God is the Holy Ghost. The Spirit of God is the Holy Ghost. You understand? So anyway, okay. Y'all don't know why I laugh. I just... I just. Then, and the angel answered and said, Now watch, Mary answered, How shall this be saying, I know not a man? Oh yeah, beautiful, isn't it? If she wasn't a virgin, then she would be disqualified by God. Because he has to be virgin born. He cannot have the seed of his father. He can't have that sin nature. You understand that. Come on. Praise God. Now watch. I want to show you something. You with me? And I'm going to close pretty soon. So y'all stay with Deuteronomy 22. I'm going to show you something. When I wrote these things, this understanding down, I didn't do nothing but cry. I sat there and cried because it was so, the only word I can think of to explain it is lovely. The most lovely thing, lovely thing. An obscure passage in Deuteronomy chapter 22. She had to be virgin born. Come on, somebody. Now, when she gave birth to Jesus Christ, you know, I'm sure because the Bible tells she ran out for three months or or thereabouts up to Elizabeth's house and was telling her what was going on and the salutation. And I don't believe that Mary knew what was happening to Elizabeth because had she knew what was happening to Elizabeth, then she probably could have put it together that, hey, she's supposed to be the mother of Jesus. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? But when she gets there and she makes that salutation in the womb, uh, John leaps in the womb of Elizabeth, but that was last week's message. But I want to show you something. What a beautiful thing it is. The virgin born son of God. Deuteronomy 22. An obscure passage in the Old Testament. Y'all love God today? Amen. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you something. You don't love him like he loves you. No, no. I don't love him like he loves me. All I can do is preach this message, preach this word to you, and, and hope that you'll fall in love with him. Because he is showing you, demonstrating his love for you. Deuteronomy 22. Mary is a virgin. And you can, you can get this understanding. You can go to manners and customs in Bible times. Uh, you can get the history of the background of a lot of the Bible in manners and customs of Bible times. It'll explain things to you. But in Deuteronomy chapter 22, if you go there, please, notice what the Bible says. Thou shalt not... See, thy brothers, uh, 22, 13. Okay, 
If any man take a wife and go in unto her and hate her. See, Joseph, when Mary comes back, he's going to find out that she's carrying a child and he hasn't fathered it. Are you with me? Mary, did you get in trouble over in the hill country? How did that happen to you, Mary? Because I didn't father this child. You are a spouse to me. You are married to me in a civil ceremony. But I didn't have intimate relationship with you. What happened to you, Mary, when you went over in that hill country? Did you get in trouble? And Joseph is going to enter into a consternation here with this whole situation. How are you going to explain that the Holy Ghost is overshadowed you and the, the, the child you're carrying is the Son of God. Yeah, right. Who's going to believe such a story as that? You go, Mary, and you tell Joseph, your espoused husband, that the Holy Ghost overshadowed you and you're with child is the Son of God. Yeah, he's really going to believe you. You understand? So we find out, as we read the stories, we understand this time. That Joseph was in great, a great struggle here. He didn't know what to do. Put her away privately is what he decided to do. Come on. Because evidently Mary has played the harlot. So Joseph, what are you going to do? Ah, oh, come on. Watch this. I'm going to show you something. Beautiful. Beautiful. 22, 13. Let me read it again. If any man take a wife and go in under her and hate her. And give occasion of speech against her and bring up an evil name upon her and say, I took this woman. And when I came to her, I found her not a maid. She wasn't a virgin. Then shall the father of the damsel and her mother take and bring forth the tokens of the damsel of virginity and the elders of the city and the gate. Let me show you what's going on here in that culture. Virgin, a young woman, a virgin, when she got married to that young man. And they had intimate relationships on their marital night. They would take a cloth and they would wipe the blood. The hymen broke. And the hymen is a membrane that partly closes the opening of the vagina. And when that is open, blood comes from that young virgin. And they take a cloth and they wipe the blood. And they take that, that cloth that has the blood of her virginity. They take that cloth, the young man and the young girl. They take it to her parents. And they, and they show the parents, this is the proof that you're daughter was a virgin the hymen was broken by this young man for the very first time and the blood proves that she is a virgin and you can only give your virginity away one time and the breaking of the hymen can only happen one time so they've got the tokens of their virginity and if she gets married later on and the man hates her because she wasn't a virgin. I come against the spirit that would seduce the young women in this church. I come against the spirit of young men. Uh, yeah, let me just, I'm going to preach on this a little bit. A young man tells you he loves you so you'll have sex with him. Does not care anything about you. Because if he really cares about you, he will protect your virginity until you get married, my friend. Don't you fall from the lie of that young man that says, I love you. Let's have sex. Because if he really loves you, even if you came after him, he'd say, no, honey, I can't do that. I've got to protect your virginity. I've got to make sure that we don't have a relationship until we get married. I've got to protect you. All this sexual promiscuity. You can only give your virginity away one time. So if this young maiden gets married. The hymen is already broken. So now they don't have proof. That she was a virgin. At the time she got married. You understand? So that young man hates her. You with me? Come on. Why? Because she wasn't a virgin. There's, the hymen's already broken. Got quiet in here, didn't it? The Bible says, but let's, show, let's look at it this way. This young woman is a virgin. She got married to this young man. The hymen was broken. Now they've got the proof, the blood on that cloth. The young man 
and the young girl, thank you, brother, run up there to the parents of the young man and they give the token of her virginity to the parents of that young girl. So that if that young man ever says she wasn't a virgin, at the time we got married, all they got to do is get the elders of the city together and call for the parents. And the parents go and they bring out the cloth that's got the blood that proves that she was a virgin and says to the elders, look, we've got the proof. This is the token that she was a virgin. And he just hates her. And they take that man out, they whip him, and they make him pay a hundred shekels of silver, and they make that man live with that young woman for the rest of his life. Amen. Because he was wrong when he accused her of being a harlot. Give God some praise. But if they can't produce the fruit, the tokens of this virgin's virginity, the parents can't. Let's find out. I'm not going to read all these verses, but the Bible says... Verse 21, verse 20, But if this thing be true, and the tokens of her virginity be not found for the damsel, then they shall bring out the damsel to the door of her father's house. The men of her city shall stone her with stones that she die, because she hath wrought folly in Israel to play the whore in her father's house. So shalt thou put evil away from among you. God have mercy on the parents that go by birth control for their young teenage daughters. God have mercy on that person's soul. He said if she can't prove that she's a virgin, if the tokens of that virginity cannot be produced by her parents, then she's going to be taken outside of her father's house and they're going to bury her under a pile of stones. It is capital punishment to have sexual relationship before you get married in the eyes of God. There has to be a legal binding, a legal covenant, a legal ceremony of marriage. God recognizes that. If you don't have that legal binding ceremony and covenant and proof of marriage, then for you to have a relationship with that man, you committed harlotry. You understand what I'm trying to say? And in the Old Testament, they stone you to death. Just like that. You understand what I'm trying to show you? Woo! Give God praise. I'm thankful today. I'm thankful for today that today you can find grace. That God can forgive you even of that if you truly repent of your sin and you stop playing the whore. Stop living with a man you're not married to or a woman you're not married to. Come on, somebody. You need to understand the seriousness of this. You must be married. I know it says they were stoned to death. Now watch this. Come on, somebody. Amen. So when Joseph finds out that Mary has a child, he knows he didn't do it. And she is civilly married to him. She's in a betrothal. So he doesn't know what to do. Come on. Because if he brings it out in the public, he knows they're going to stone Mary to death. Come on. And if he divorces her, he breaks that, that uh, betrothal. He breaks that. He said, it, it's just as good. Because if he breaks that betrothal, then he has nothing to do with her. Either way you look at it. If she's stoned to death, he has nothing to do with her. If he divorces her, he has nothing to do with her. But an angel appears to Joseph by night and said, Don't be afraid to take Mary to be thy wife. Because that which is in her is conceived of the Holy Ghost. That's the Son of God inside of the womb of Mary. And Jesus Christ was the... Listen. Mary was a virgin when she gave birth to Jesus. She's the only woman in history that the child broke the hymen. The only woman in history that the child broke the hymen. You get that? The blood. When Jesus came through that that canal, that birth canal, and he broke that membrane that, that partly closes the opening into the vagina, he broke the hymen. And the blood flowed from his mother's womb. And I, I'm telling you, I sit there and I cried at the wonder of it. She's the only one that that ever happened to before. She was a virgin. Yeah. 
And I recognize that there is blood at the time a baby is born. But I'm just showing you. You with me? That when Jesus was born, as soon as he broke that little membrane, they could have wiped Mary with a piece of cloth. And they could have walked over there to Joseph. And they could have said, see, she was a virgin. You understand how powerful that is? See, I don't know. God has a reason for putting everything in his mind. Virgin. Mary was a virgin. She had never known a man in her life. And her son broke her hymen. Give God praise. Beautiful. I know that's heavy for you. I know you don't want me to talk about things like that. But that's why you're in the mess you're in. Because you don't understand things that are sacred. Things that are holy unto God. But the good news today is if you have messed up, you don't have to be stoned to death. Not just messed up, sinned against God Almighty. And you've lost your virginity. You know what? God can cleanse you with His blood. Come on, He can forgive you, bring you into His kingdom. Now let me help you. If you have sinned that way, today from this day forward, repent. If you'll repent, God will look at you as if you had never done it. Because He can put it under the blood. And God can restore the years that the canker worm, the palm worm, the locust hath eaten. It doesn't mean you'll get your virginity back because you can only lose that one time. But you will be a virgin in the eyes of God Almighty. Give God praise. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Beautiful. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. Jesus. Let me share with you today. Right now, you need to repent of that. You need to stop playing with that. You need to get, I'm not accusing anybody. You know where you are. Hallelujah. Now the Bible goes on and says this. If you go on down, we're going to read the celebration of Mary about this. Verse 46, Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord. Brother, show me where we are, please. The Lord, my soul doth magnify the Lord. You can't magnify God by yourself. Come, let us magnify the Lord together. I can't magnify Him by myself. I've got to magnify Him, then you've got to magnify Him. And, back and, forth, and He gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger as far as your understanding goes you understand he started, he started singing my soul doth magnify the Lord and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior for he hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden God is observant he saw the low state of his handmaiden come on for behold from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed for he that is mighty hath done to me great things God in His omnipotent power and holy is His name. And His mercy is on them that fear Him from generation to generation. He has showed strength with His arm. He's, he's singing, man. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. You know why He did that? Because people who are proud don't think they need God. So He scatters the proud in the imaginations of their own hearts. A prideful person, a proud person, they don't need God. They, don't, they, don't, they won't live for God. The Bible says, He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. Now, come on, man. You need to understand this little peasant girl named Mary was a poor young girl. So was Joseph. He was the town carpenter, you know. And I know they were poor because all they could bring was a pigeon as a sacrifice at the time of his birth. They couldn't bring the, the, the larger sacrifices of a wealthy person. All they could find is just what the law made provision for them to bring. A few little pigeons. <laughs> I can't see that. My goodness. That right now? 
I'm almost done, so it don't matter. <laughs> Y'all awake? He hath filled the hunger with good things, and the rich hath he sent empty away. She's singing about this. Come on. To the rich he has sent away. Now, 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 hold on. Everybody that's poor is going to jump up in the church and run right there. Because they look at that as like rich or having something is a sin. But what she's showing you here is this. Is that when the Bible says, now I'm going to read it again. Okay. He hath filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent empty away. You know what he's showing you? A rich man, again, same thing about prideful man. A rich man does not see their need for God because they've got everything in the material world. He's not preaching against wealth. Or, there ain't nobody in this church rich with money. None of us. I know some of you think you are. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> but a rich person like that, you know that story? It's harder for a rich man to enter in the kingdom of God. It's harder, what is it? Harder for a camera to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples then ask, who then can be saved? And then it goes on and explains, they that trust in riches. It's not people who have something. It's people who trust in riches. So all you people are oh, thank God, I'm poor. Just because you're poor don't mean you're saved. There's a lot of poor people going to be in hell. There's going to be a lot of rich people in hell. But they that trust in riches. You trust in riches. It's harder for you to enter the kingdom of God than it is for a camel to enter through the eye of an eagle. Trusting in riches. Because when the disciples heard that, they said, who can be saved? They had something. They were a part of their daddy's fishing business, man. <laughs> okay, hallelujah. They probably fished the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee. <laughs> Y'all talking about right? Oh, hallelujah. So she's from Galilee, a culture that's got all kinds of wealth. Rich peasants, but they're poor. And she's showing you people who trust in riches. God's going to send them empty away. We can never trust in riches. So it's what you're trusting in. Are you trusting in God? Or are you trusting in your money? Are you trusting in the car you're driving? Are you trusting in the clothes you're wearing? Because ain't nobody can be saved. The Bible says, who then can be saved? Ooh. Those that trust in riches won't be. Because they put God on the back burner. They don't need God. They don't live for God. Their whole focus is Riches. She's singing, hallelujah, because, I mean, she's poor. It's God. Not even in Jerusalem. He's not even going to be born in Jerusalem. He's going to be born in Galilee, Nazareth. Can any good thing come out of that? And to a couple of poor people, Joseph, a city carpenter, and her, a young 14, 15-year-old girl, they don't have hardly anything. Can't be Messiah, can it? Can't be. But that's what God chose. That's where God chose. Oh, give God some praise. And he hath helped hope in his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. And he spake to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. And Mary abode with her about three months and returned to her own house. Now, two possibilities. Number one, she didn't see the birth of John. She just made the announcement, stayed with Elizabeth for a few months, went back home. You with me? Or she was there when John was born. The Bible doesn't tell us. But if she was there when John was born, she heard the prophecy of Zechariah, John's father. And when he takes that wax tavern, he writes, you shall call, you're going to call his name John. He breaks out, and the spirit of prophecy comes on him, he breaks out, he starts prophesying. And the whole time, if she were there the whole time, he could point at her and say, there she is. There he is. In the womb of that mother. Okay, I'm not done. I gotta go. I gotta go a little further. I'm not done. I gotta finish the chapter. Watch. He breaks out in prophecy. Come on, are you with me? 
Mm, this is so awesome. Verse 67, his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people. There he is. He's inside of that little girl right there. There he is. God. God has visited, visited his people. Verse 67. You remember 68. And redeemed his people. He hath raised up the horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. There's the horn of salvation. It took the death of a male lamb to supply a horn to Sam. He's the horn of salvation. Come on. I don't have time to explain a horn to you, but go through the Word of God. You'll find out horns. They grabbed a hold of the horns of the altar in order to have a refuge. Come on, somebody. There's a horn, the horn of royalty, Zechariah talks about. The horn of refuge. Come on, somebody. Whatever, whatever. In fact, this is the horn of royalty right here. Just go through the Word of God and study a horn. Power. Power. Singing, isn't she? She was singing now. He's prophesying. And he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. He's the fulfillment of the prophecy in that little girl right there. Come on. She is the fulfillment of prophecy. He is the fulfillment of prophecy. That we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of our... Uh, of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham. Ah, Elizabeth, oath. Ah. God's keeping his oath. There he is. My, my, my wife's name's Oath. Zachariah means the Lord will remember, and John means grace. Ah. God's keeping his oath. God remember to keep his oath by grace. There he is in the side of the womb of that mother. That he would grant unto us that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness, in holiness, in holiness, oh, in holiness. I can't, I'm going to preach it over and over. In holiness, in holiness, in holiness, and righteousness. Before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord, prepare his way to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission, by the remission of their sins. There you go. Yeah, the knowledge, there you go. Yeshua put it there. Yeah. <laughs> Through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us. Come on. To give light to them that sit in darkness and the shadow of death. To guide our feet in the way of peace. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit. This is called about John. So what he's showing you is this. Okay, the day spring's on high. He's the sun that the moon predicted. See, the prophecy of the Old Testament, they were the moon. The moon reflects the sun. So the prophecies, we're looking at the fulfillment of the prophecy. They saw it. The prophets saw the fulfillment of the prophecy. They, were, they saw it. And so those prophecies were the moon that reflected the sun that was behind the moon. Now, the Bible says, Zechariah's got a revelation. He is the sun that was behind the moon. He is the sun that the moon reflected. He is the fulfillment of the prophecies. The moon, the sun, was what they prophesied. And now for those people who are sitting in darkness out there in the middle of a desert land somewhere, have lost their way, all of a sudden the light shines and they see the path. That they could not see. You see, you get the picture? They that sit in darkness, a great light has shined. Uh, be like you sitting out in the middle of a desert. It got dark. You couldn't find your way. You couldn't find the path. Didn't know what direction. And all of a sudden, light comes on. And you say, there's the path. Whoa, I see it. And then you, then you, you were sitting. Then you jumped up. Get the wagons. Let's go. Here it is. I'm sorry to have bored you this morning. But let's stand and let me dismiss all the bored people. I had a time of my life. I really did. I had a time of my life this morning. Call his name Jesus. The virgin born son of God. Somebody shout the name of Jesus. Lift it up. Lift it high. Neither is there salvation in any other name. So if you're sitting in darkness today, a great light has shined. Get up. Get on the path. He is the way. He is the way. Hallelujah. Let's clap our hands one more time. Let's celebrate. Call his name Jesus. 
Okay, amen. Beautiful, man. Beautiful. So, by the grace of God, we'll start chapter 2 next, next Sunday. Hallelujah. That first chapter is the big one. It sets the groundwork for all of them. So, anyway, praise the Lord. Y'all, y'all, y'all come back next Sunday and I'll bore you again. <laughs> You're tired. You don't have enough rest. Come back to church next Sunday and you can sleep in church. Bow your head and let's pray. Father, I just thank you for your glorious word. Wonder fulfillment, God. The salvation that you offer to all of us, forgiveness of our sins. You provided a way. Your name is Savior. Your name is Jesus. You came to seek and to save that which was lost. That was me. Now I'm found. I love you today. I thank you today for your goodness and your mercy. I can sing in a sense like Mary for the redemption that has come to me. I love you and I'll glorify your holy name, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.